Let's review Mancuse chapter 13, Principles of Economics. First thing in this chapter was explicit and implicit costs. Explicit costs are the costs that require an outlay of money. All that means is that you can see that money leaving a business. Versus implicit costs are opportunity costs. You can't see how that money otherwise would have been spent or what other opportunities were available. Now, accountants might look at a company that has explicit costs as well as its revenue and go, wow, you're doing really well because accounting profit is revenue minus explicit costs, yet the economists are a little bit more dismal. They say that economic profit is revenue minus explicit costs as well as implicit costs. Uh, next thing that we ended up learning was this thing called the production function. Now, what the production function measures is simply how much output is produced with various levels of an input, like you see here. Early on, you start to see that production function rise at an increasing rate, but then there becomes this point in which it's still increasing, but the slope or the rate starts to become less steep. And then there's this point in which the slope actually becomes negative all the way on the right over there. And so we say that that first segment in which the slope is becoming steeper and steeper represents increasing marginal returns. The next segment represents diminishing marginal returns. And the last segment represents negative marginal returns. Now the reason why that's important is because we use this thing in the rest of microeconomics called marginal product. Now marginal product is your change in your total product, which is what we've got on the vertical axis, divided by a change in some quantity of an input. And so when we're looking at these three different sections, they could also be substituted in for marginal product in that we have increasing marginal returns or increasing marginal product, and then we have diminishing marginal returns or diminishing marginal product, and then we have negative marginal returns or negative marginal product. So marginal product is the slope of this total product curve that we see here. Okay, and then our next section of this chapter, fixed costs, variable costs, total costs. So, we could also represent those in a graph, and it would look something like this. Now this black line here, where it's just straight across, the number doesn't change at all in terms of costs on the horizontal or on the vertical axis. It's fixed, it stays the same, and so we call that fixed costs, versus this blue one ends up changing as our output changes, so we call that variable costs. Okay, and then up at the top we've got total costs, which is fixed costs plus variable costs. So if we were to look at that total cost curve, it would be as high above variable cost is as fixed cost is above zero. So this amount right here would be equal to the difference between these two curves, right? The distance between fixed cost and zero here would also be equal to the distance between fixed cost and our total cost and variable cost there. Okay, and then we've got our averages. These are our per unit cost curves. Okay, so fixed cost, variable cost, total cost, we're not really adding anything here except now we're looking at what if we divided those curves by the amount produced. And so fixed cost was one number, right? Like 100, but average fixed cost would be 100. Produced at one unit would be 100. But now if we produce two units, the average fixed cost would be 50. If we produce three, the average would be 33.3 and on. And so what we see is average fixed cost diminishes as we increase our output and it gets closer and closer to zero but it never quite touches zero. Okay, then we've got uh, average variable cost. Now, with that variable cost curve, uh, it initially increased at a diminishing rate and then it skyrocketed. And so if we took the average of that, mathematically what that would end up looking like is a smiley face in that we start to become cheaper and cheaper per unit on average because of specialization and division of labor. But then as we start to crowd out, we see those variable costs go up and up the more units that we produce in a fixed amount of space. Okay, and then like total cost was fixed cost plus variable cost, average total cost is gonna be average variable cost plus average fixed cost. And so this curve as well is going to be as above average variable cost is as average fixed cost is above zero. What you'll notice is they're all divided by quantity of output now. No longer input, but output. Okay, so this distance right here is the same or should be the same as that distance as you're drawing these graphs. So keep in mind, maybe jot down a few points before you plot that average total cost curve to make sure that you are going to create it as high above average variable cost is as average fixed cost is above zero, okay? Additionally, these two distances should be equal to one another and these two distances as well. So average total cost is approaching average variable cost just like average fixed cost is approaching zero. Okay, then we add marginal cost. Now marginal cost is your change in total cost divided by your change of your quantity 
of outputs, the amount of things that you are making. Now there's a couple of rules that we have to follow here with marginal cost. It has to cross average variable cost at average variable costs minimum. It has to cross average total cost at average total costs minimum. In the book, it talks about how your GPA is like an example in that if my total cumulative GPA is something like three, and then this semester I get a 2.5, my marginal GPA is less than the average and so it would lower that average. Yet, let's say that I continue and I increase my grades a little bit and so now my average GPA is something like three point, uh, or, or yeah, just three, we'll use that example still. But then I have a really good semester. I get a 4.0 and so that's going to raise my average just like marginal cost if it's above your average total cost, it would raise your average total cost. Or if it's above your average variable cost, it would also start to raise your average variable cost. Okay, now let's talk about shifting. In shifting curves, there's really kind of only two possible things. Either you've got some lump sum or something that's, you got some lump sum or something that's affecting your fixed costs, in which case, if your fixed costs are affected, that's gonna also affect your average fixed cost because it's gonna be the affected number divided by the quantity. But then total cost and average total cost are both made up of, in part, fixed cost and average fixed cost. So total cost as well as average total cost would also be affected, but nothing else. So if it's just affecting fixed costs, like let's say each company has to pay $1,000 to the government uh, as a tax every single year, then your fixed cost, your average fixed cost would be affected because those are going up. And then your total cost and average total cost are also affected since total cost is fixed cost plus variable cost and average total cost is average fixed cost plus average variable cost. Okay, now let's say that we've got a different type of tax, a per unit tax. In that case, if I make more units, I have to pay more in terms of taxes. And so my variable cost would be affected. As a result, my average variable cost is gonna also be affected, but then my marginal cost would also be affected because each unit is going to end up being taxed. That's gonna make my costs per unit go up as I produce more units and my marginal cost would also be affected likewise. Okay, and so variable cost is gonna be affected, average variable cost is gonna be affected, marginal cost is gonna be affected, but those, or rather the variable costs, are contributing components of total cost as well. So total cost will be also affected as well as average total cost. Okay, lastly, we've got short run average total cost, which is just generally what we think of with average total cost, but then we will also talk about uh, long run average total cost. So we're used to seeing an ATC or an average total cost curve like this, but what if we're thinking about maybe expanding the size of our factory? We say that we experience diminishing marginal returns because we start to crowd out our space. But in the long run, there are no fixed costs. There's not really any fixed input like space or factory size. You can adjust that in the long run. So with our average total cost curve, this average total cost curve represents a small factory choice. But we could also say, well, what if we want a medium sized factory? Maybe it would look like this. And then maybe we have a large size factory that looks like this. Now. Which one's gonna be the best for us depends on the quantity of output that we're going to be producing at. So this first quantity here, you can see that if you follow along on that first average total cost curve, we hit that average total cost curve first before the other ones over there. So at quantity one, my cost with the small factory is lower than my cost with the mid-size factory. So if I'm producing that amount of units, I want the smaller size factory. But Maybe I can produce and sell more units than that, in which case, maybe I'm producing a quantity two here. Now, producing a quantity two, I would probably, or I would rather, have a lower cost with my large factory versus the medium-sized factory, and for sure the small factory. So you can see that the cheapest per unit that I can get is with that large factory. Now, reason is I'm experiencing diminishing returns way later. My factory has enough space for individuals and my costs can go down as I experience specialization, can have more workers, they're not crowding each other out. Now, we actually have a lot of different sizes factories. And so let's say we take every possible component, in this case it's only five, but maybe there are you know, different additions, maybe it's more variable than that. You can have certain square footage added with each factory. In reality, you could have a lot of average total cost curves put together. Now, the long run average total cost curve is producing at your most efficient, um, given you could pick any sorts of these factories at any output. And so you can think of long run average total cost curve as like the possibilities of your average total cost being the most efficient that you could be. And it would look something like this. 
So we would look at all of the minimums of all of those average total cost curves added together, and then we would create a long run average total cost as a result of all of those most efficient places. Now, the long run average total cost curve can be broken up into three segments. We have economies of scale, constant returns to scale, and then diseconomies of scale. Economies of scale is like when you can increase the size of something and you can produce something way cheaper than before. So microchips is an example. If Mr. Fear was gonna start trying to make microchips, they would be extremely expensive because I'm not very good at it, my factory wouldn't be all that big, and I'd have produced a lot of things in not a very efficient way. Yet when companies can grow and become much larger, they can produce some goods way, way, way cheaper, and they experience economies of scale in which as they increase their output, the cost per unit on average goes down. Okay, but then sometimes there's this thing called constant returns to scale in which adjusting your size still kind of gets you this constant return. If you increase the size of your factory, you're still producing units at this lowest possible cost. If you decrease the size, you're still at that low cost. So if we have a constant change with our change in our size in factory of average total cost, we're experiencing constant returns to scale. Okay, but then sometimes companies can grow so big that they mismanage resources, they're not quite as efficient, and that's when you get to diseconomies of scale. And when you have really, really large companies that have been around for a long time, now starting to declare bankruptcy and whatnot because it's tough to manage all of the different hierarchy or whatnot um, that leads to inefficiencies for this company, leading to an increase in the average price per unit. Okay, and that is everything from chapter 13.